This is news breaking from the American Heart Association. We are announcing it for the first time right here. We're back now with a new warning today from the American Heart Association. De los Estados Unidos, la doctora Regina Benjamin, miembro directivo del American Heart Association. Case studies indicating COVID may lead to heart attacks. Joining me right now is Dr. Mitchell Elkin. He's president of the American Heart Association. <laughs> So have you joined the Boss Family workouts recently with Twitch and Allison? I mean, we love those two from So You Think You Can Dance, Ellen, and Dancing with the Stars. But now they have teamed up with the American Heart Association. It's live with Kelly and Ryan. Years ago, the American Heart Association revised their out-of-hospital CPR protocol, and it's called Hands Only CPR. She's now sharing her story as part of the American Heart Association's Don't Die of Doubt campaign. This is all about the American Heart Association's healthy bond for life. Late today, the American Heart Association putting out an advisory to pediatricians. As sales of marijuana soared during the pandemic, a new warning from the American Heart Association. Tonight, the American Heart Association sounding the alarm. A new report from the American Heart Association. Heart disease is the number one killer of men and women here in the U.S. and worldwide. So when the American Heart Association puts out a scientific statement, people tend to pay attention. Según la Asociación Americana del Corazón, hay tres factores que contribuyen a padecer del COVID complicado o fatal. And joining me is Dr. Mariel Jessup, the American Heart Association's top medical officer. Dr. Michelle Albert is president of American Black Cardiologists. She's working with the American Heart Association to research COVID in black women. Dr. Larry Mittenall is an American Heart Association volunteer. Okay, to before is Malek McDonald tonight talks with the CEO of the American Heart Association about surprise medical bills. This is why I love the American Heart Association. They step up in real time to address a need. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sue Antonio, Executive Director of the American Heart Association here in the greater Washington region. We're so excited to welcome you as we kick off our 31st annual Lawyers of Heart campaign. Since 1991, Lawyers of Heart has raised over $16 million for the American Heart Association. You funded life-saving research, advanced public policy, and created a platform for our legal community to address our world's greatest health risk, cardiovascular disease. Yet, we have so much work to do. Heart disease is still the leading cause of death in the world. It claims more lives each year than all forms of cancer combined. And heart disease accounts for about one in three deaths in the United States. Every 39 seconds, 39 seconds, an American will have a heart attack. These startling statistics includes our friends, family, and colleagues, yet 80% of this disease is preventable. All of us at the American Heart Association are committed to being a trusted voice on health issues affecting our community, along with eating right, being active. Real health includes getting enough sleep, practicing mindfulness, managing our stress, our mental health, and keeping mind and body fit connecting socially and with our community. Today, we're so delighted you could join us and we have a phenomenal lineup of leaders, inclu including Lori Besden, Executive Director of Lawyers Concerned for Lawyers of Pennsylvania. Lori is the definition of success, graduating in the top of her law school class 
and having a successful career as an attorney. She has a compelling story to share about the importance of mental health and well being. Joining Lori will be dedicated members of our executive leadership team John Harity, heart attack survivor and partner at Harity and Harity, Associate Dean of Student Affairs from America University College, Washington College of Law, David Jaffe, and the incredible story of Sandy Maxey, controller of Harity and Harity who has lost over a hundred pounds to take care of her heart health. Our hope today is that you leave this kickoff ready, ready to join the campaign and to be an agent of change, to be a relentless force for a world of healthier, longer lives. It's now my pleasure to introduce our 2021 co-chair of Lawyers of Heart, John Harity. We're so grateful to have John at the helm. His passion and dedication for this work shines in all that he does. Please join me in welcoming John. Thank you, Sula, and thank you everyone for attending today's event. I'm honored to serve as the 2021 co-chair of the 31st annual Lawyers Have Heart event. I thought I'd start uh, my portion of this event telling you why I'm involved with the American Heart Association. On May 2nd, 2016, I was playing in my regular Monday night basketball game. We were close to wrapping up for the night when I started experiencing some unusual shortness of breath. As I was exiting the gym to go get some cold air, I knew there was something wrong. I asked my friends to call 911 and then I passed out and I woke up three weeks later in a bed at the local hospital. That night on the basketball court, I experienced the worst type of heart attack that you can have. It's called the widow maker. And the thing that's unusual about my heart attack is that I don't have any characteristics for heart disease. In fact, I had spent decades exercising seven days a week and following a very strict and healthy diet. Fortunately for me that night, my friends James Bennon and Rocky Burnson were brave enough to act. Within seconds of my heart stopping, they had called 911 and started performing CPR, which was obviously instrumental in me being here today. When I arrived at the hospital, my situation got gravely worse. I experienced bleeding into my lungs, which sent me into respiratory distress, and that eventually led to multiple organ failure. During the first few days at the hospital, my wife was told more than half a dozen times that I was not going to make it. And then anyone in my life that she thinks should, should come to see me before I pass should get there immediately. Well, I made it th through those first few days. And then over the next few weeks, my body fought off numerous blood clots and infections. My, part, my cardiologist later gave me the odds of me making it through those first few weeks, and he put the odds at a million to one. So why did I survive? My doctors were unanimous on this, and they said it was really my obsessiveness about exercise and diet was the reason that I'm here today. Well, I eventually woke up three weeks after my heart attack, unable to speak and unable to move. From the second I woke up and understood what had happened, I was laser focused on two things, getting back to 100% and ensuring that I don't waste my heart attack. You see, I feel that if I just went back to my old way of life, then this traumatic experience would have been for nothing. So during the, the following five weeks, as I lay in intensive care, regaining my ability to speak and move, I had many conversations with my twin brother, Paul, who's the other Herity of Herity and Herity. We knew, we, need, we knew that we needed to do something more and we needed to convert our firm to really being purpose-driven and, and focused on serving others. And it was in that bed at the hospital that the foundation for Herity for Charity, our giving back initiative was born. My firm donates 5% of our profits each year to our four partner charities. One of those being the American Heart Association through the Lawyers Have Heart campaign. In addition, Every single employee at my firm gives a portion of their paychecks to our partner charities. Since its inception, we have given over $1 million to our partner charities. So here's the big takeaway from my heart attack. I truly believe that if this can happen to me, 
then this can happen to you, your family, and your friends. Heart disease is our number one killer. And that is why the work that the American Heart Association is doing is so critical to all of us. And really that's why I am here today volunteering my time to the American Heart Association and co-chairing this event. So turning to the Lawyers Have Heart event, we obviously have the health and safety of our participants. They're our number one priority. Um, and this year's Lawyers Have Heart event is going to be a completely digital experience. With no geographic boundaries, we're looking to recruit colleagues, friends, including four-legged friends and family members from around the world to participate right at home or wherever they want. And together, we will continue the fight to end heart disease and the COVID-19 pandemic. In the chat, you're gonna find a link to our website where you can register, start your team, or make a donation to the American Heart Association. My firm, Heredy and Heredy, is going to be matching up to $50,000 made to the campaign through the end of the day tomorrow. Please join the fight to end heart disease by participating in our Lawyers Have Heart event. I look forward to seeing you at the virtual starting line in June. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce you to my friend, my fellow co-chair, an all-around awesome guy, David Jaffe. David, take it away. Thank you, John, uh, for sharing your story and Sula for sharing of information and your ongoing dedication to the cause and to the American Heart Association. Uh, I'm David Jaffe, Associate Dean for Student Affairs at American University Washington College of Law. While I was out running my 5K this morning, I said to myself, self, there are 331 million people in the United States, according to the most recent census. How many of them will run, walk, roll, exercise today? It was important that I was one of them. I run for my physical health to be sure. And I also run as an example for my two teenage daughters and for my law students with whom I run every Saturday morning. But I also run to take care of my mental health, to clear my head at the beginning or at the end of each day. As Sula mentioned earlier, you control 80% of the risk factors of heart disease. John was training for his heart attack, if you will, his entire life. He took control of that 80%, including his mental well being. Lawyers are 3.6 times more likely to, to be depressed than the average population. We also know that over 20% of the legal profession is battling substance use disorders. These numbers are just simply not sustainable. Mental health includes our emotional, psychological, and social well being. It affects how we think, feel, and act, and how we relate and interact with others. When experiencing depression, anxiety, stress, and even PTSD over extended periods of time, there are certain physiologic effects on the body, such as increased heart rate, heart rate, high blood pressure, and reduced flow to the heart. Over time, these effects can lead to calcium buildup in the arteries, metabolic disease, and to heart disease. Anxiety and depression can also increase the chance of, of adopting adverse lifestyle behaviors, such as smoking, an inactive regime, not taking prescribed medications, or just not being in the moment. So I invite you, I ask you now, as I know many of you are multitasking, to stop multitasking. Take the next few minutes with us, sit back, relax a little bit, and hear the story of somebody who's been to health and back. Lori Besden, as introduced, is executive director for Pennsylvania's Lawyers Concerned for Lawyers. She's one of the most charitable and caring individuals I've ever met, and she technically should not be alive and with us today. Lori, I give it to you. And of course, I'm the person that stayed on mute. Thank you so much, David. And thank you to all of you from the American Heart Association for the incredibly important work that all of you do and the awareness and education and raising the mission across the board. And John, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. 
I just want to echo a couple of the numbers that I heard so far. 31 years, the AHA and lawyers have combined together helping to raise $16 million. $16 million lawyers have hard have helped to raise. So thank you so much for teaming together. I want to also emphasize and thank everyone on this panel for normalizing this conversation. We talk about heart disease without stigma. We talk about cancer without stigma. You have a challenge, a cardiovascular challenge, you go to a cardiologist. You have cancer, you go to the oncologist. But when you're struggling with mental health, there's a stigma that's an illusion that causes a silence that is costing us lives. The programs like this help us to normalize. It is a sign of strength and resiliency to ask for help. And it's so important to do that, to do that when you're struggling. As you just heard, 80% of heart disease is preventable. And when it's not, when you don't take care of yourself, whether it's trauma or whatnot, physical ailments will actually manifest themselves from things like trauma or not taking care of your body causing heart conditions. So taking care of your overall health has never been more important. When we talk about you know, mental health, substance use, as far as even cancer, diabetes, it sounds so ridiculous if people said, yeah, I'm not gonna go to the oncologist. I can probably think my way out of this cancer. That's ridiculous. It's just as ridiculous to say, I can just think my way out of this depression. It will go away. Chronic, progressive, fatal. We all know people that have lost their lives because they were not able to get the help they needed in time. This must stop. Want to quickly and briefly talk about the resources that are available in the legal profession. Although we are LCL Pennsylvania, every single state in the United States has a lawyer's assistance program, confidential, safe, supportive resources for you and your family members. Let me talk a little bit about what we have witnessed in Pennsylvania in the last I'll say, you know, 13 months. Initially, pandemic hit, the entire world was in shock going through trauma and helpline numbers across the board, not just in Pennsylvania, across the board decreased. People worried, were worried about their basic needs, food, shelter, employment, getting children to school through Zoom at the kitchen table that was now becoming the desk and the eating place for your family. The last five months, LCL Pennsylvania has received the greatest call volume in any five month period in our 33 year history. Greatest call volume. And with over 80% of all helpline contacts presenting with a mental health challenge. I, first of all, it's fabulous that people are reaching out for mental health needs and needs in general and family members needs. I expect this the impacts and ripple effects of this pandemic to be going on for, and for us in the profession to see it for years to come. And we all need to continue to do our best on education and normalizing these conversations. So we're 13 months into a pandemic. I now no longer, when I start a presentation, need to say how many people know someone that has struggled with a substance use mental health challenge and or died from and or recovered from because every single one of us now has firsthand knowledge of trauma, defined as an emotional upset. Nobody predicted the pandemic. No one was prepared. We were all dealing with one card at a time as it turned over. And so at this point, it's okay for me to say, it's okay if we're not okay. We're all in this together. We are all in this together. Trauma, like I said, lives in our bodies. And if it is not handled and properly treated, it will manifest itself with a physical ailment such as heart disease. It is so important if you're struggling with a mental health challenge, please, please get help. These things are costing us lives and they don't need to. I wanna briefly talk about a statistical, I don't know if I should call it a coincidence, an irony correlation. We were talking about heart disease accounts for one in three deaths in the United States. Let's correlate that with two landmark studies that came out in the legal profession, um, it, the ABA Patrick Krill study, as well as the law student wellness study that was conducted by our own David Jaffe, along with Organ and Bender. This, the statistics and results yielded this, one in three legal professionals 
will struggle with a substance use or a mental health challenge at some point in their legal career. So there's that one in three again. Those were pre-pandemic numbers. I guarantee you if those self-reported studies were conducted again today, the results would actually be, the statistical, statistics would actually be greater than one in three. 80% of heart disease is preventable. Depression, 80% of the time, depression is successfully treated. Depression and substance use disorders are medical diagnoses. And with treatment, the prognosis of recovery is excellent. Again, I'm gonna say it, without treatment, chronic progressive fatal. Although Robin Williams was not in our profession, he's the guy that had all of us laughing and at the end of the day, it cost him his life. This needs to stop. So the American Heart Association focuses on a healthy lifestyle, not an event style, although this is an event. They've been doing this for 31 years and their entire mission is focused on eating right, physical activity and mental health and well-being. Let's keep in mind, it takes 66 days to create a habit. So we're now all used to kind of staying home and now we're trying to transition back into a new norm. So I've been invited here today to share my story um, with you and I appreciate that opportunity. Um, I want to, I think the theme of what I wanna say is I believe, and we just heard John's amazing, amazing story. I believe when we're born, we're all given a deck of cards. And in that deck of cards, you have 52 cards. They turn over in a timing that you do not control. I'm not gonna get philosophical, but I believe we are handpicked for our deck of cards. That being that we will utilize the experience, the obstacles, the challenges to then help other people and pay that forward to other people through our experience, strength, and hope. Those of us in recovery, we can only stay sober by giving it away and helping the next person. So as we say, we can only keep it by giving it away. So I believe as far as my deck of cards, I believe my strongest card was struggling with a substance use disorder and my subsequent recovery. In my life, the angels have been disguised as several judges, district attorneys, law enforcement officers, volunteers with LCL, judges across the board, folks that are in recovery, our amazing lawyers concerned for lawyers board, my predecessor, our staff. And these are the angels that showed up in my life that were planted to help me get through my deck of cards. I want to also say I, as a person in long-term recovery, I am not unique. There are millions of us in recovery. I am simply just one story and I was asked to share it with you. If I can say anything that sticks with you, um, as long as somebody is breathing, there is hope. And I sincerely mean that. So I, um, I don't want to say I should watch what I'm saying because my mom is on here today, but um, I was... I was born and raised in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. And I often say I was um, raised in a two-story home. There was one story on the outside, one story on the inside. And I say that with the utmost of love. Um, my parents did a great job raising us and they wanted children so much that in fact, they went through artificial insemination to have me and my sister. My sister's three and a half years older than me. And I mean, we were raised, we had, a, and I'm just, Speaking candidly, um, a life of privilege. We had a shore house growing up. We still have that um, overnight camps. And we were given everything for a life of success, everything. Um, and if love was enough to you know, help a family member struggling, I would have been cured overnight. But unfortunately, that was not the case. Inside the house, you know, I did not realize growing up as a kid that my parents were not happy. I thought it was normal that dad slept on the couch and mom, I had no idea. Dad was the you know, disciplinarian and mom worked really hard. He were, I, I thought that was normal. How would we know different? But from the outside, people used to come to our house on Sundays. My mom would make pancakes for all my friends. And that's what I mean, you know, two-story house. Growing up, Education was very important in our family. Before we were even born, I believe my parents knew and my mom's parents were very, you know, strong belief in education um, that we were gonna be, one of us would be an attorney, one of us would be a physician. So we kind of came into the world with that um, understanding. 
And I was always getting in trouble. And my sister's three and a half years older. I barely remember her childhood. I was just speaking to her about this because I was always causing problems. All the attention was always on me. So starting off first, I was eight years old, went to the dentist for a routine dental cleaning and the dentist gave me nitrous. It was the first time in my life that I was outside of my own skin and felt a euphoric rush. And I thought, wow, this feeling, I finally feel comfortable in my own skin. I literally, now why I ever would have gotten nitrous at that age, I can't explain that. I literally chased that feeling of being comfortable in my own skin until it landed me in jail at age 29. Age 12, First time of my best friend and I, my best friend slept over. We decided, what a great idea. We're 12 years old. We're going to have a friend of ours drop off two six packs of beer. Never drank before, but this seems like a brilliant idea. Parents go to sleep. It's now two o'clock in the morning on actual Mother's Day, 2 a.m. And we are drunk, my friend and I, walking around the neighborhood, half dressed. Of course, my dogs have to sit here and eat their bones as loud as they possibly could while I'm doing this. So I apologize. Uh, we are half dressed, walking around my neighborhood, Plymouth Township, and the police pull up. Where are you girls going? Oh, we're just walking around the neighborhood with the unopened beer. End up going to the police station. We go to the police station, and you know, I remember all, all four parents came, and they called my mom, and they said, we have your daughter. And my mom was like, no, not Laurie. She's in her bed sleeping. That was the first of many calls like that. And so... I remember parents came and I pinned the whole thing on her. And I said, oh, this was Shelby's idea. She's such a bad influence. Shelby is now a pharmacist. And she's also not the one here sharing her recovery story that landed her in jail. So Shelby was clearly not the problem. So carrying on high school, I mean, I'm just going to say it was uneventful. Um, I, you know, I did what my friends did. I was not yet the only person doing, you know, drinking or drugging. Um, my sister was now at Penn State. Then it comes time for me to go to college. I decide I'm going to University of Maryland because I always felt like I was compared to her. I'm sure that was just in my head. There was a lot that was just in my own head that I was the only one that thought and heard these things. So I decide instead of comparing apples to apples, I throw an orange in the mix. And so I go to University of Maryland College Park. And again, and I just say this in passing because what family you come from, what resources you have, makes no difference when it comes to substance use and mental health. Absolutely no difference. Our grandparents paid for all of our education. All we had to do was show up and go to school. And so I, undergraduate criminology, criminal justice major, every semester my grandparents, and I, I talked to them often, especially my grandfather, he would say, how are your grades? 4.0, 4.0, 4.0. I got one B in college, graduated in three and a half years with 3.97. But let's roll that back a little. I was living in a suite with six girls. Uh, my best friend, who is still my best friend today, on Thursday nights, we would get a case of beer between the two of us. We would start drinking in the shower. And I, and I say this every time I speak, I honestly thought that was time management. So you'd be drunk by the time you actually left your house, left the apartment, went out. You wouldn't even have to buy alcohol. And I thought it was normal. She was doing the same thing. And look, look at my grades. I mean, how could there possibly be a problem? The fact that every night I drank ended up, I ended up throwing up, passing out, waking up in random places. I never thought that that's actually what the problem is. Um, I just thought my grades meant everything. That's what I believed was important. I would be so drunk on Thursday nights. I had an internship with parole and probation on Friday mornings. I would still be drunk. I would go to that internship, line the corner stall with paper towels, and try to nap off a hangover in the parole and probation office where they're taking urine samples from people. The irony is I later ended up on parole and probation um, years later. And so that was college. And every time I drank, it was a disaster. I was never the person who drank one beer with, that was never my story, ever ever, never, you know, the romantic, you know, holiday commercials, never my life. So at this point, my sister is now um, heading to medical school and I'm graduating and my family, which is good that, you know, my greatest science was botany. That was certainly not happening for me. And so they, my family sat me down because I was a semester early and said, so what do you plan on doing the rest of your life? And I said, I'm, 
I'd like to go to cosmetology school. And they said, oh, that's great. How about going to law school first? And then you can go to cosmetology school. So I end up volunteering in North Philadelphia for the extra semester I had with a nonprofit. And it was actually in the badlands of North Philadelphia. And I remember being really nervous going into the neighborhood, broad daylight, just a really rough neighborhood. Forward into my addiction, I would go into that exact same neighborhood in the middle of the night to buy drugs by myself, not an ounce of fear in me, nothing. Not once did I think, what if I get killed? Nothing. And I certainly was not driving around with a weapon. So I'm now in law school. I hear the presentation my predecessor presented. And he said, LCL, the prevalence rates in the profession of substance use and mental health. I couldn't even believe we had to listen to this. I'm like, we're in law school to represent those people. What is he saying that we are those people? And I actually felt bad for him, which is kind of funny because I now have his job. So, um, so I go through law school. Didn't think anything about lawyers concerned for lawyers at all. Um, received a brochure, stuffed it, and found it as I was actually uh, packing up to head home after my three years in law school. And I maintained top 15% in law school. Everyone there was like, I just want to, you know, be a trial attorney. And I'm like, I just want to cut hair. Like, I was just lost. Literally, I was just lost. I feel like I was lost my whole life never felt comfortable in my own skin. And so whether I stuffed it down with drugs, alcohol, food, people, whatever it was, I needed something else to be, to feel like I was whole. So I was in a car accident, my third year of law school, we were coming back from a Pearl Jam concert. I was the passenger in my own car, drunk, went into the guardrail, end up at the emergency room. They gave me 30, 20 or 30 pain pills, Vicodin or Percocet, I don't recall which ones. And I, I really was not that injured, but it was the first time, it was not the first time I had pain medication, but it was the first time I had pain medication that I didn't really need it. And so I took the pills and they, it was literally, I felt like I put a cape on, I became superwoman and I could solve the world's problems. It gave me a surge of energy to sit and study for 18 hours. Um, and I thought, wow, this is really, I mean, this is not a normal response to pain medication. What it actually was doing was treating an untreated ADHD. And also simultaneously, while I was going hundred miles an hour into a drug addiction that I didn't realize, I missed a memo that said, you will need these pills like oxygen to keep going. So ultimately what I started doing is I started going emergency room shopping and you know, going and bring my big law books. I'm legit, look at me, big attorney. And I would have the ERs giving me 20 to 30 pain pills. And I thought, I'll just keep this up through finals. Ultimately, I've met, I met a gentleman on an internet blog who said, if you call this doctor in Texas, he'll prescribe 100 Vicodin, DHL overnight delivery, four refills. Call him and say, you have a back problem. I call this doctor, I'm scheduled an appointment, Two days later, overnight delivery DHL, 100 of these pain pills come to my apartment at law school. And I thought, wow, okay, now I'm going to take them through finals, graduation happens, parents, family, they're there, we're graduating law school, this is great, we're going to have a lawyer and a doctor. I was already in the bathroom counting how many pills I needed to get through the day, having no idea that I couldn't stop. I ended up taking Pennsylvania and New Jersey bar exams. Um, and by that time, I had three to four different identities going with the same doctor. I was taking three 10 milligram pain pills an hour to get through that exam. Passed both bar exams. And I say that because I needed those pills like people need oxygen. I could not function without them. I was the last person to get the memo that I had a drug problem. Forward on, I had a trip planned to Spain and Africa with the guy that I was seeing and living with who had no idea that I was on drugs. I ended up flying back solo after calling in a refill from a payphone in Spain for my recreational drug problem. And I had a clerkship that started um, on, in August on the Pennsylvania Superior Court for a former Supreme Court justice. Started that clerkship in August. By December, I had nine identities going with the same doctor. I had, unfortunately, I had drugs being delivered to chambers. DHL overnight signature required nine different identities, my name, dog's name, family's, family names, boyfriend's names, fictitious names, 40 pain pills a day. Um, 
to literally just wake up and get through the day. I called the pharmacy under whatever identity I was under at that time from the Superior Court. And they said, your doctor's been suspended, my doctor, treating my nine identities from Texas and the rest of America. So at that point, still thinking, well, I'm ahead of this. I'm just going to think of something smart here. I then started to pick up the persona that I was a physician. So I thought, well, I'm just going to start calling in my own prescription. Brilliant. So I start calling, I started doing that. And once I was able to do that, not that at the time it required that much, but once I was able to figure that out with the DEA numbers and MD numbers, I then literally started my access and tolerance skyrocketed because I had so much access to the drug. By the time that one year clerkship was over, I was taking at least 45, 50 Vicodin a day, Ambien and Xanax every single day. And that was literally just to get through the day. I didn't miss many pharmacies in 180 mile radius. I didn't from Center City, Philadelphia to Margate, New Jersey. Then that clerkship was over. Then I had another clerkship, unfortunately for the court system. I had another clerkship lined up on the Philadelphia Municipal Court for three judges. And the accountability was not, um, you know, was not, I did not have to be in the office in chambers five days a week. So they would give me cases, I would take them home. To be honest, in the beginning of that clerkship, I got together with a friend from college and she was going to bring ecstasy, which was a drug that I tried in law school. And you know, there, I never met a drug I didn't love or want to chase. And so she was going to bring ecstasy. And when she showed up, she pulled out you know, a mirror and said, I couldn't get the ecstasy, but I have this and pulled out cocaine. And I, I still like to this moment, even though I was completely under the influence of narcotics, remember looking and thinking, now that drug is serious. Like maybe I shouldn't do that. And ultimately I of course decided to do it. And I did not put that drug down until my freedom was taken from me. I don't know, I think it was three, four days later, I'm calling her drug dealer saying I have friends and family in town, family, and I need some cocaine for my family. I mean, my behavior and my addiction was outrageous. I can't think of another word for it. I was going into the courthouse criminal justice center in Philadelphia, cocaine strapped to my stocking with a straw, no fear of drug dogs, nothing. Security, no problem. I was a superwoman. I could just fly right over security. Within two months of starting cocaine, I went from a healthy weight of 150 to about 110 pounds. At this point, my mom contacted the one judge that I was clerking for and said, Laurie really needs some help. Um, you know, she's gonna need some time off. The judge said, yes. I mean, I looked homeless. I was in like layers of sweaters, nose bleeding. I was a mess. So my mom, it was before like Google where you're going. And my mom, you know, gave me an address. I pulled up MapQuest and I assumed I'm going to rehab. So I was on a four day cocaine vendor and knew like, I'm gonna do an intake. So I stopped at Dunkin' Donuts, got a dozen donuts, 45 munchkins, had not eaten a morsel of food in four days. Show up for the intake, I'm eating, they're doing the intake. Then they go to take you know, vitals, wait, and they tell me face the other direction. I said, why am I facing away? And they said, you're at an eating disorder facility. And I was like, I don't have an eating disorder. Like I really legitimately did not. And they said, you know, they literally observed me eating all of that food for hours and sat there and then did not admit me. And I share that because it's so important that if you are concerned about somebody not to diagnose them, because that misdiagnosis cost me, thank God I'm not in jail for killing somebody on the road after that moment. When they wouldn't admit me, my mom went one direction and said, you know, I'm manipulating professionals. I went in the other direction and I was on a tear. Every time I was behind the wheel of a car, I was completely high and under the influence. And she, my mom did her best. She just, and in her own words, will say, she just never even thought there could have possibly been a drug problem in our family in a million years. So at this point, I don't even remember the rest of the second clerkship. 2002 to 2004, just to give the stats, 29 car accidents, three incarcerations, three rehabilitation centers. Five convictions for prescription fraud, felony convictions. In that time, let me just go back to some of my outrageous behavior and my addiction. I uh, recently, and, and I'm gonna show some pictures here in a few minutes. The bottom line is I was trying to ration my own drug use. I was now living at my dad's, not working. I would put 
cocaine under his mattress to try to prohibit me from using that and save it for the next day. So when he was sleeping, I couldn't go and get the stash of drugs. I would wake him up in the middle of the night and be like, oh, I put the dog's treats under your mattress. I mean, I was 28 years old behaving like this. I would also put cocaine in his car. So when he went to clients, houses that I wouldn't have access to the drugs. I have my dad driving around with enough cocaine that he could have been charged with distribution. I had, I found a wedding dress in my addiction that was on the curb in front of a bridal store. And I would actually put this wedding dress on and mow lawn in broad daylight. And I just confirmed all of these facts with the gentleman and friend that I lived with in 1999. And I said to him, I used to mow lawns in broad daylight in a wedding dress and nobody thought there might be something wrong with me. And he's like, we just always thought like you just were like a little crazy and had like a little crazy personality. Um, I mean, all through my life, like this behavior, just so outrageous, you know, and, and the worst of it, I remember just looking out my window and thinking, you know, I'm seeing the sun come up, people going to work, walking their dogs and just thinking, what would I do? just to be one of those people get waking up instead of coming to walking a dog and literally just going to any job. And sh had I written that down as my goal for sobriety, boy, would I have sold myself short. I wanted to die and I didn't know how to accomplish that. And I thought the only way for this addiction to stop would be for me to die. So at 2004, so I was arrested multiple times, went through all of that. January 29, 2004 is my sobriety date. On that day, a volunteer from Lawyers Concerned for Lawyers, Dave F., reached out to me as I was being arrested. Later, reached out to me as I was at the police station um, and said, you know, I'm a volunteer with LCL. I'm going to help you. I'm an attorney. I'm 31 years clean and sober. And all I heard was an attorney. I'm like, I didn't even get to jail yet. And I already have representation. I had no idea what this organization was about. Did not remember it from law school. I'm transported to jail on January 29, 2004. I was detoxing from $2,000 of cocaine a week, 55 Vicodin a day, Ambien and Xanax. Of course, I was looking for the detox unit and they were like, wrong rehab, put your mattress on the floor and we'll take your vitals. Dave came to see me that day, told me to hang in there, start going to recovery meetings in the prison, brought me big books for both fellowships. He kept coming to see me and I'm like, what? I don't understand. What? Who are you? Who sent you? And John Carroll sent him, but he said, hopefully one day you can help some people. And I'm like, help people? I'm not, I'm not gonna help people. I just wanna get high. And I didn't believe I could stay sober, but he had 31 years. Who stayed sober that long? I didn't even know it was possible or that desirable. So at this point, bottom line, he ended up coming back, coming back. And we, we put off my sentencing eight and a half months. I unequivocally thought the judge was going to um, let me go and or require me to go to rehab and ultimately, Judge Carpenter, who was my sentencing judge for all of my cases, he listened to everybody pleading for my freedom um, and then said, no, nope, 11 and a half months, uh, no good time work release. Unequivocally, that man sentenced me to the option of a new life and saved my life by giving me the one gift that my family could not buy, and that was time. 100% between Dave showing up in my life and giving me the message of recovery and Judge Carpenter saying, no, you need more time. That is why I'm here today. And all of the angels in disguise that have been disguised as all the law enforcement um, is why I'm alive today. So ultimately, I'm incarcerated. At 11 and a half months, I and Dave kept coming to see me. I ended up being... By the time I was discharged, I was 253 pounds. I picked up the new addiction of food. I went in at 110. I left at 250. Um, and I went to probation that day. And then Dave said, listen, I'm going to help you find a job as a paralegal. I mean, LCL volunteers will do anything to help the next person above and beyond. And so he got me um, involved with a firm that was looking for a paralegal. And Dave said, you know, report everything to the disciplinary board, just send them a letter. So I ended up sending them a letter. Um, you know, I, sorry, I missed the reporting deadline by, you know, four years, I was arrested five times and went to jail and ended up entering. And they were like, did you really write this letter? I ended up entering a three-year suspension on my law license in PA in New Jersey. 
Uh, simultaneously also lost my driving privileges for violating the Cosmetic and Pharmacy Act for two years. And at this point, I started, I became a person in recovery, started going to community support meetings for drugs and alcohol, started going to the lawyers recovery meeting in Montgomery County, and started even bringing meetings back to the prison. And at this point, I was working on my health. I remember at this time, I was walking on a treadmill because I couldn't, my body weight, I couldn't even handle anything more intense. And so I continued doing all of that and being in service. And then Dave said, you know, we should file for reinstatement. I'm like, I'm a convicted felon. Who's going to think this is a good idea? We filed for reinstatement in 2008 as I was still working at that firm. And we had a hearing um, on that. At that hearing, Dave testified on my behalf, the partner in the firm, sponsor, mom, um, as well as detectives that arrested me, if I didn't already say that. And ultimately, by a power much greater than myself, I was unanimously recommended to be reinstated to the practice of law in Pennsylvania in 2009, New Jersey in 2010, and then came on board with LCL in 2011 as the deputy director, working underneath my predecessor, the guy that I felt bad for. Um, and in 2015, when he retired, I then became executive director. I am the product we sell with the lawyer's assistance programs. It can happen to me. Look at this life. Look how well, look at my stats on paper. Oh my God, I can't breathe without drugs. I will die. I will do anything to stop this addiction. And then earth angels show up and show me the way. And now today I will do anything I can to help anybody who is struggling. I want to say as horrible as incarceration was, it unequivocally saved my life. Being incarcerated was the first taste of freedom that I had. Uh, being in an active addiction was the greatest prison I've ever been in. In jail, I mean, I had my first and only surprise party of my life. My 30th surprise party was a Sunday. I was coming back from visits and all the inmates jumped out of their cell. They made cakes with like Swiss rolls and peanut butter, nutty bars, and all saying happy birthday. And I thought for once in my life, I am like smiling and laughing. I realized I was incarcerated and obviously where were the inmates gonna be? Of course they were gonna be in their cells on the unit. But when I think back to incarceration, I remember the visits I had with my family. I was thinking about this the other night. Those visits meant everything to me. I waited for those visits. I mean, we would sit for an hour at a table and hold hands. And my grandmother, who at the time was in her late 80s, would come and like argue with the guards that she didn't have drugs in her cane. And I mean, literally just sitting and spending time with my family, I will never, as long as I live, forget the gift of time that that incarceration gave me and laughter and joy. So now that I am a person in recovery, I want to just say some of the things that I do are I volunteer. Um, I volunteer not in my personal life. I bring meetings to the prison where I live. One of my rescue dogs volunteers with dementia residents. I volunteer at a shelter, an animal shelter. I've been doing that for the last nine years. Every Saturday, I'm walking dogs. Every major holiday, I'm walking dogs. I take dogs to events. So many rewards of recovery. Um, as a healthy person, I am a Peloton person. Um, David and I actually ride the Peloton together. I'm, it's, it's the way I set my table every day. I'm on that Peloton an hour every single morning. Um, and that's just what I do today. So many rewards of recovery. Um, I, in 2017, filed for a governor's pardon. Um, just thinking, why not? You know, we get sober and let's, you know, be made whole to the extent that we can. I had a hearing in December of 2019. Um, at that hearing, not only was I supported by LCL, um, several of our directors, Dave, um, our president, but I was also supported by the Chief Justice of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, the judge that sent me to, to jail and saved my life, the president judge, Judge Del Ritchie in that county, Several, and Judge Furman in Montgomery County, as well as well as the LCL staff, as well as friends and family, as well as friends from other agencies of the court in which I was suspended from the practice of law, that now I've made all of these friends. And I will never forget, they drove two hours to Harrisburg to stand by my side at the podium and ask the pardon board to please forgive my crime and show the ultimate sign of redemption. 
I will never forget that day as long as I live. And I'm going to show a picture PowerPoint in a few minutes, um, a picture from that day. And ultimately, uh, again, through a complete miracle of a power much greater than myself, my governor's pardon was granted um, August 27, 2020. Um, and my criminal history in Pennsylvania has been erased again by a miracle of God. Um, I wanna just say, and probably the most difficult thing that I've done in my sobriety is I do not have children, but I lost two dogs um, and I had to put them to sleep at different times. And by far the darkest and hardest time of my life. Um, the first dog, I did not think I was gonna be able to live through that. And what did I do? I went to a recovery meeting that night. They opened it so my mom could be there. And that night literally single-handedly got me through the worst night of my life. Um, I am very involved with community service in the fellowships. Um, I have a service position with my home group. I have a sponsor. I attend meetings. Um, I, like I said, I bring meetings to the prisons here. I tested in 2012 and 13 to donate a kidney to a colleague. I was actually approved to donate the kidney, went as far as pre-admission testing before she received a call from uh, the folks at a UPMC that they had a kidney, someone had passed away from life support. This journey and the angels that walked before me um, brought us to this stage at Harvard. Um, I've had dinner at Judge Carpenter's home in early 2020. I've been given the honor and opportunity to share my story with the Peloton community through their podcast, reaching people internationally that have been struggling with a substance use and or a mental health challenge. I submitted a TED talk. Um, I also, when my grandmother was passing away in 2011, I was part of the hospice home team and giving her morphine. And not one time did I think to myself, you know, I, you know, what does this taste like? And so ultimately, I just want to say anything is possible as long as somebody is breathing. I am going to quickly share um, my screen. So bear with me. I want to go through a couple slides in the next few minutes. Okay, so this is my family growing up. Um, grandparents on the left, my sister, Jody, and parents. This is me and my addiction. You can see uh, that's the wedding dress that I was mowing lawns in. This is obviously, I mean, and I've contacted this person who's in the picture and I'm like, did you think it was normal? Someone was in a boa randomly in their backyard. Um, and I, you know, I just, I mean, this is addiction. These are the scripts that I would actually write out. These are from actual addiction. I found them in the aftermath that I would write out with the DEA number. So when I was so high on cocaine, I could follow this script and call in a prescription. This is the last uh, lineup that a pharmacist had to identify me on bottom left there. At this point, my hair was falling out. You can see in the front, I had no hair there from my addiction. This is the picture of me when I was released from prison in 2005 at 253 pounds. Those are my dogs, Amazing and Grace, um, and my Christmas tree that I leave up for six months a year because as a child, we didn't celebrate Christmas. So as an adult, I certainly do now. Um, and Amazing volunteers with dementia residents. She goes to the local memory care and volunteers. She, there's Senator Alloway, who was behind Libra's law, uh, extending the animal rights to the animals in com the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. She's been to the Capitol. She goes with me to law schools. This is the post I saw uh, from Patty on Facebook that she was asking for a kidney. That's how I found out and then silently tested until I was a match and approved. That was Patty. And unfortunately, she passed away from ovarian cancer. This is the day of my pardon hearing. There is Caroline, uh, the Chief Justice's dog. There's the Chief Justice, myself, Judge Risa Furman, Court Administrator Jeff Moulton, President Judge Tom Del Ritchie, and Judge William Carpenter. Judge Carpenter is my sentencing judge. Again, this is a day, as long as I live, I will never forget. There's the governor's pardon. This is an event that I um, that we were all at. And the miracle of this story is in 2017, I knew I was artificial insemination, sent my DNA away, which is kind of crazy when you're a convicted felon to be sending your DNA anywhere, and located my biological father. And to this day, we're up to 10 siblings. 
So in the red is my mom, in the tan is my biological father, Steve. And I grew up with Jody in the black dress and there's Jamie in the black top and Noran on the end. Um, and Steve has embraced all of his biological children and we all get together and it's really quite a love story. I make jokes that if you stay sober 13 years, you get a whole new family. There's Dave, the volunteer, and Stephanie Shark, who is the district attorney that prosecuted my case in 2004, speaking with us at Harvard, then again at um, American, skydiving. I've done some crazy things in my um, recovery. I am uh, ordained and I officiated my vet's wedding last summer. Uh, I'm Peloton person, went in the studio with several of my judge friends, and that's instructor Ali Love there in the center. My Maisie has been to the Chief Justice's chambers and has play dates with Caroline in at the Judicial Center. And there's the amazing LCL staff. That was our humorous um, holiday card that we put together to send out to folks. Um, you know, for 2020, we thought that that was a good. Um, let me just get out of that. Okay. And so, in closing, I just want to say, you know, I think. I think it's important that we all just leave the world a little bit brighter than when we arrived. I realized I've been on borrowed time for 17 years. As long as somebody is breathing, there's hope, there's help. We are all miracles. We all have a story. We've all navigated our deck of cards 100%, one card at a time. And we all have the wisdom and insight, insight to pay that forward. I'm definitely alive only because other people shared what they learned and their insight with me. 80% of heart disease is preventable by living a healthy lifestyle. Not a day, not an event, but a lifestyle. Paying it forward is also a lifestyle. So again, I just wanna thank the American Heart Association for inviting me to share my story at this kickoff event today. And I will put my information in the chat in the event that there are any questions that I may not have answered when I spoke. Thank you so much for letting me share today. Lori, thank you so, so much. Uh, Sandy's gonna jump in, go ahead, Sandy. Sandy, you're muted. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so Lori, your story is so incredible. Thank you so much for being an inspiration for our community. Uh, preceding this call, you will receive an email with your continued learning education materials and more information about the Lawyers Have Heart 10K, 5K and walking taking place or walk taking place June 11th through June 13th this year. We are asking you to take action today and register. Bring your colleagues, friends, and family members to rally with the AHA. As John mentioned, all donations to the American Heart Association are doubled through tomorrow. We will have 10,000 participants from around the world running and walking for a healthy life and a healthy mind. Join the movement and together we can put an end to heart disease. Thank you and see you at the virtual start line on race day.